Hello, and welcome to this NJCU Center for the Arts digital event. Thank you, and enjoy the event. Hello, everyone. Welcome so much. Um, welcome today. I'm Stephanie Chaikin. I'm the director of the NJCU Center for the Arts. And on behalf of NJCU and President Sue Henderson, I would like to welcome you again to our Saturday series of virtual programs at NJCU. Um, today, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues. And before we start, I would like to um, acknowledge a moment of silence for um, the loss of Chadwick Boseman. Um, he brought Jackie Robinson to life um, on the screen in the film 42. So our hearts go out to his family and um, thank you for his contribution to us. Our guests today are Bob Kendrick, who is the president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. He's joining us from Kansas City, Missouri. And um, Brian Lapinto, who is the president of the Friends of Hinchliffe Stadium. Um, he's joining us from here in New Jersey. And to give a little background, um, Bob is one of the leading authorities on the topic of Negro Leagues baseball history and its connection to issues relating to sports, race, and diversity. He's been a contributing writer for Ebony Magazine and the National Urban Leagues Opportunity Magazine. Bob is president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. And prior to that, he was the museum's first director of marketing. He was promoted to vice president of marketing in 2009. And he also served as the executive director of the National Sports Center for the Disabled in Kansas City in 2010. And then he came back to the NLBM in 2011. So welcome, Bob. Thank you. Brian Lapinto has been a tireless advocate for the restoration of Hinchliffe Stadium in Patterson, New Jersey. He um, got the bug because he was born and raised in the shadow of this landmark stadium. He played baseball when he was here in the stadium in, when he was in high school in 1992. And his first hit as varsity baseball player came when the Clifton Mustangs played Kennedy High School at the stadium during his junior year. And Brian still has the baseball. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Brian co-founded the Friends of Hinchliffe Stadium in 2002, a volunteer nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving and revitalizing this structure. Brian and fellow board members got Hinchliffe placed on the New Jersey and National Registry of Historic Places in 2004. And he produced two films plus a documentary about the stadium. And he has continued to work with the mayor and the state to restore this amazing, iconic stadium. So Bob and Brian, I'm going to um, kick this off to you. I think we have a film uh, that Bob has brought to, to open up our history. Yes. Welcome to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. It is the world's only museum dedicated to preserving and celebrating the rich history of African American baseball and its profound impact on the social advancement of America. People come here expecting to meet some pretty good baseball players and you're going to leave not being disappointed you're going to meet some of the greatest athletes to ever play this game you walk away with an even greater appreciation for just how special this country really is because the story of the negro leagues could have only happened in america yes it is anchored in the ugliness of american segregation a horrible chapter in this country's history but out of segregation rose this wonderful story of triumph and conquest and is all based on one small simple principle you won't let me play with you then i'll just create a league of my own those leagues the negro leagues were formed right here in kansas city 
They helped make the game the global game that it is today. And quite frankly, the Negro League didn't care what color you were. All they cared was can you play. These athletes loved the game of baseball so much that they were willing to endure whatever social adversity confronted them as they traveled the highways and byways of our country just to play baseball. That passion would not only change our sport, but it would change our country. This wonderful, precious piece of baseball and Americana that escaped the pages of American history books. Countless generations of us went through our own formal educations without knowing one of the most significant chapters, not in baseball history, but in American history, the story of the Negro Leagues. By the time you've bared witness to everything that they endured just to play baseball in this country, then the very last thing that happens here is, now you can take the field. Well, again, he hello, everyone. It is an absolute pleasure to be able to join Brian uh, and to be part of this program today to share with you all a little bit of history as it relates to the Negro Leagues. As Stephanie mentioned, 100 years ago, these leagues were formed here in Kansas City. So we're in the midst of celebrating a year-long 100th anniversary celebration, albeit coronavirus has done quite a bit to try and, and derail many of the plans that we had over the course of the year, but we're continuing to find ways to keep this celebration uh, alive. And that intro video kind of gives you a little bit of a look and feel for what we've done with building the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum here in Kansas City, a project that started 30 years ago here at historic 18th and Vine. And to give you an indication about 18th and Vine, 18th and Vine in its heyday was as recognized street cross section as there was anywhere in the world because you had that intrinsic mixture of jazz and baseball radiating from this one street corner. And, and so when we decided to anchor to build a Negro Leagues baseball museum here in 1990, 18th and Vine was no different, Brian, than what Patterson has become in some ways. Uh, and like a lot of urban areas across this country, 18th and Vine had died as well. And, and so when we started to down the road to build this museum, to be quite frank, some of our most ardent supporters say, you're crazy. Don't build a museum there. Who's going to come and see you? And I can understand the trepidation sure. that we had because there was nothing here at 18th and Vine at that time except the Lincoln Building and which is where the museum started in a tiny one room office about a fraction of the size of my office that I'm sitting in right now. And guys, all it had was a conference room table and guys like the late great Buck O'Neill, the legendary founder of the Negro Leagues Museum, legendary Negro Leaguer in his own right, and other Negro Leaguers who were still with us at that time, they literally took turns paying the monthly rent to keep the little office open. And so that's how we got started. And, and here we are now, 30 years later, recognized as America's national Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. But just as important, we've led a resurrection of what was once a very proud, prominent African-American community, 18th and Vine. And, and, and that's why I'm excited about the work that Brian and, and all of those who are involved with saving Hinchcliffe Stadium. And there are not very many remnants of these stadiums left where Negro League <laughs> baseball was played. And I think they have an opportunity to do the exact same thing there. And, and before, I, before I get too deep in my conversation, uh, I'm a, I don't really want to apologize for my attire, but I would typically be all natty like Brian is today. <laughs> but as Stephanie mentioned, we're all suffering a little bit of a deep loss from the passing of Chad Bozeman, who I got to know in 2013 when the epic film 42 was released and here in kansas city we had i think the second largest screening of the film 42 only behind la but as i was sharing with anna and stephanie backstage in la they get to do that all the time in kansas city we hardly ever get to do that so that was a rarity and so to have chadwick bozeman 
and Andre Holland and Harrison Ford here for our screening was amazing. And when we were on the red carpet, and, and I'll let y'all in on a secret. I'm from tiny Crawfordville, Georgia. Crawfordville, Georgia is all of 500 people. So this was my first trip on the red carpet. And I ain't lying, y'all. I milked the carpet for everything I could get out of it. I went up the carpet. I went back down the carpet. I went back up the carpet because I didn't know when I was going to get back on the carpet. But while we were on the red carpet, Chadwick presented me with a jersey just like this. This is the 1945 Kansas City Monarch Road jersey. And if any of you saw the film 42, in some of the opening scenes of that film, he's wearing this jersey. And so he presented me with the actual jersey that he wore in the film. And, and that, film, that jersey hangs proudly inside the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And so while we lost this tremendously talented, gifted young man at such a young age, I guess it gives me some level of solace to know that his legacy will continue to play on here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. So I tip my cap in memory of Chadwick Bozeman and how, he brought, how he brought Jackie Robinson to life. So Brian, man, it's great to catch up with you again. I'm going to take this hat off and hopefully y'all see me a little bit better. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I think just to, just a little bit ab about that. I know the world sometimes would see him as, as Black Panther to me. He'll always be Jackie Robinson. I, I did see the original Jackie Robinson film that Jackie played in. Uh, it, it's a definitely a different film. Um, <laughs> but I will say for sure, um, I, was, I was wrapped up in, in that 42 film, and I was stunned to see that this morning. I, 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 wasn't oh, God, we're, I, I got the news last night, and it put me right into a mode of having to do media interviews because they knew the connection, obviously. And, and it was Jackie Robinson Day. And which right. also makes this jersey even more appropriate because yesterday was the coronavirus delayed Jackie Robinson Day uh, around Major League Baseball. And for those of you who weren't aware, Jackie <laughs> plays here in 1945. And I think when we celebrate Jackie Robinson, of course, when Major League Baseball celebrates Jackie Robinson, they celebrate, celebrate Jackie Robinson from the day that he walked out on the field as a member of the Brooklyn Dodgers. But for us, while the film 42 was so important, is that it was one of the first real references of Jackie's Negro League roots. Yeah, it all starts here in Kansas City in 1945. And the year that he was here in Kansas City, he fell in love with everything Kansas City is famous for, barbecue and jazz. Yeah, he liked the ribs at a place called Old Kentucky Barbecue. Old mm. Kentucky Barbecue is now the forerunner of the great Gates Barbecue chain of restaurants. And of course, he fell in love with jazz, which was born in New Orleans. But let me tell you, it got its soul here in Kansas City. Uh, it was, Kansas City was a mecca for jazz. And so hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about the music of that era, uh, as well as we delve into the program a little bit more. But again, Brian, man, it's great to see you again. Congratulations on the work that you guys are doing. Would you please just enlighten the group a little bit about the importance of Hinchcliffe Stadium? Well, I mean, what is there to say? I mean, Hinchliffe Stadium is the only national historic landmark that honors baseball. On top of that, it is the only sporting venue within the boundaries of a national park. And it's one of the, the last remaining Negro League stadiums in the country. To say that Hinchliffe Stadium has national significance is actually an understatement. It is incredibly important. As you mentioned earlier, there are so few locations in which uh, these games are that played that are still around. Um, you know, I think we love seeing things like, say, Josh Gibson's bat and Larry Doby's jersey and maybe cool Papa Bell's glove. But where those things were used, it was Hinchliffe Stadium, Rickwood Field, League Park in, in Cleveland, which, you know, they, didn't they weren't able to restore the whole thing, but there's still, like you said, remnants of it. I think the ticket is still there. Yeah. They're trying to do in Michigan and Hamtramck Stadium. You know, this isn't a competition. We would love for all of those places yeah. to to, to, to thrive and survive and, and, and these places to, to be there for future generations. And we firmly believe that Hinchliffe Stadium needs to be there for future generations. I mean, Hinchliffe Stadium, if, and at some point we'll, we'll look at some images, Hinchliffe Stadium, if you look at it, it was built for football, but baseball marked the time and it marked the time through the Negro Leagues. And it's important for people, especially locally in Patterson, 
to understand that without the Negro League history, we wouldn't be saving uh, this old stadium that was built in 1932. Yeah, you know, it, it's amazing. And, and when we look at the history of the Negro Leagues, as we kind of gleaned on, it started here in Kansas City. Now, black baseball history goes well before 1920. Sure. You know, we've been playing baseball for a long time. You know, there's actually evidence of us playing baseball as enslaved people. And, and there were independent professional black baseball teams prior to the formation of the Negro Leagues in 1920. But primarily at the urgence of the black press, Rube Forster led a contingent of eight independent black baseball team owners into a meeting held at the Paseo YMCA here in Kansas City, literally just a block and a half from where I'm sitting right now. That is where the Negro Leagues were formed. They, they met there and that's the legendary Rube Foster who was an absolute genius. Rube Foster, y'all, was light years ahead of his time. Rube Foster in the pre-era of the Negro Leagues had been a great pitcher. As a matter of fact, he earned the nickname Rube after beating the legendary major leaguer Rube Waddell in a head-to-head -head matchup. And they stuck him with the nickname Rube and he was Rube until the day he died. Rube Foster is also credited with having invented what we now know to be the screwball. Back then, Brian, it was called a fadeaway. Oh. And Rube perfected this pitch. So much so that the great major league manager, John McGraw, snuck Rube Foster into his camp so that Rube Foster could teach Christy Matheson how to throw the screwball. Wow. Christy Matheson threw the pitch all the way into the National Baseball Hall of Fame that he learned from Rube Foster, but he never got credit for it. But Foster was best known as this tremendous visionary, this leader. He would organize the Negro Leagues here in Kansas City. He would become president of the Negro Leagues. He owned the Chicago American Giants, and he managed the Chicago American Giants. And as a manager, Rube Foster was as crafty and as far advanced as anybody you would ever see. Rube Foster in the 1900s, early 1900s, was known to fine his ball players as much as $5 if you were tagged out standing up. You were wow. supposed to slide. Okay. Rube would draw a circle down the first baseline and a circle down the third baseline. And y'all, if every one of his players couldn't drop a bunt inside that circle, he would find them. He was adamant about the style of play that became signature Negro Leagues baseball. Bold, brash, daring. They would bunt their way on. They would steal second. They steal third. And man, if you weren't too smart, they were stealing home. And, and so that's why I say Foster is perhaps the greatest baseball mind this sport has ever seen, and nobody virtually knows who he is, even though he is rightfully enshrined in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And to think that that story, I mean, how he had to be, you know, he's good enough to teach the screwball, but you got to come in through the back door. You can't come in through the front door. It's like, wow, such a yeah. candid thing, but typical of that time, I would imagine, you know? Yeah, no, and it, and it was. And, and so Foster had relationships with the former commissioner, Kennesaw Mountain Landers. He had relationships with Cap Anson and some of those guys who had been so adamant about keeping Blacks out of baseball. And, and so when they create their league here in Kansas City, I tell people all the time, the circumstances behind creating a Negro League is what was sad. Yeah, it was a shameful period in this country's history. The Negro Leagues are not saying. No, because what they did was create this dynamic league that would operate for 40 years, from 1920 until 1960. Again, mind you, Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier in 1947. But 13 years after Jackie breaks the color barrier, the Negro Leagues are still operating. Uh -huh. But when we stop to think and reflect, it took Major League Baseball 12 years before every Major League team had at least one Black baseball player. The Boston Red Sox would become the last team to integrate 
1959 when they signed a guy by the name of Elijah Pumpsy Green. We sadly lost Mr. Green last July and he would complete the integration cycle. So that is what afforded the Negro Leagues an opportunity to continue to do business because it took Major League Baseball so long to complete the integration cycle. I think people just thought that once Jackie broke the color barrier, that black folks just ran right on into the major leagues, but it was a very slow, meticulous process. And of course, the second guy to break the color barrier in the American League played there at Hinscliffe Stadium, the legendary Larry Doby. Absolutely, Larry Doby. Um... To me, he is synonymous with Hinchcliffe Stadium. You know, I think every historic site kind of has their captain, their pioneer, their person that is, like I said, synonymous with that. And this is a great picture right here. This is Larry Doby and Steve Gromek. And what's interesting about this picture is that this is 1948. This is right after game four of the 1948 World Series. And look at these two men, two <laughs> happier people you cannot find on the planet in 1948 or even to today. I mean, this is a beautiful photograph. There are many people that believe that this is the first photograph of a black man and a white man and an embrace. But I think about this photograph and I think about game four of the 1948 World Series, which by the way, was the first time that an African-American hit a home run in World Series history. So everyone says about Jackie Robinson and Dobie's the second and Frank Robinson and, and Dobie was the second manager. Larry Doby was the first African-American to hit a home run in World Series history. And Jackie Robinson did have a, an opportunity to do that in 1947 because the Dodgers were in the World Series. Let's see, who did they play? Oh, yeah, the New York Yankees. That's a little dig to the Dodger fans out there. But uh, <laughs> how do we get to this photograph? Well, this photograph doesn't happen without one very important day in Larry Doby's life. This is... Let's go back to it's uh, May of 1942. Larry Doby is a fresh-faced young man just graduating from East Side High School, and he's invited to go in his hometown at Hinchliffe Stadium to a tryout with the Newark Eagles. Now, you might wonder, you know, it's not like he received an email, right, or it was on Twitter. How did Larry Doby get invited to a tryout? Well, the way the story goes is that there was an umpire in the Negro Leagues. His name was Henry Moore. Henry Moore was, of course, uh, you know, had a friendly relationship with Abe Manley, who was the owner of the Newark Eagles. So I almost imagine a conversation between Henry Moore and Abe Manley, and Henry Moore probably says something to the effect of, you know, Abe, you're going to be up in Patterson anyway playing the Black Yankees. Why don't you give this kid Doby a look? He might be good for your team. So he agreed to do that, and Larry Doby shows up at Hinchliffe Stadium and tries out for the Newark Eagles just prior to a game between the New York Black Yankees and the Eagles. And he does well. In typical Larry Doby form, he does well. And of course, why would he not? This is the stadium he played in for so many years. He knows how to play this ballpark. He does so well, he plays the rest of the summer with the New York Eagles. Now, mind you, he had to play under an assumed name. At that time, and, and, and I don't know all the statistics about how uh, African-Americans, if, you know, their abilities to go to college, because there was a lot of issues with keeping them out of college. Larry Doby had the opportunity to go to Long Island University uh, to play basketball, but he's a smart guy. He says, I'm not going to forego my amateur standing. I'm going to play as Larry Walker because, hey, if it doesn't work out, at least he has college as a, back as a background, okay? Um, so he, of course, does well with the Newark Eagles, and the rest, as they say, is history. Without that one seminal day at Hinchliffe Stadium, if he has a fever, if he has an injury, if he just doesn't do well, we may not know Larry Doby today. So that means maybe the New York Eagles don't win the 1946 World Series. The New York you, you always got to remind me of that they beat our monarchs, man. Listen, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know it's painful. It's got to still be painful today. And, um, and, and, you know, maybe the 1948 World Series isn't won by the Indians. And for sure, the photograph we saw moments ago would never have happened. So that's a really big point as to why Hinchliffe Stadium is important. Because, yes, it is one person. But remember, over 20 Hall of Famers played at Hinchliffe, many of whom played in the Negro Leagues. Yeah. And, and the thing that Larry Doby reminds me of, and I think it's important to note that Larry Doby never played a day in the minor leagues. 
right? He went straight from Ephraim Manley's Newark Eagles over to the Cleveland Indians. And Larry Doby was 23 years old, mm -hmm. thrown into a powder keg of racism. And yet he conducted himself with the same grace, class, and dignity that Jackie Robinson did. Now, granted, they were polar opposites. Larry Doby was very quiet, very reserved. And I think Larry did not want the spotlight. And, and Jackie was worldly. Jackie was surly and fiery and feisty. Jackie Robinson, as the late great Buck O'Neill would say, could Duke and would Duke, he'd knock you on your rump. But he humbled himself for the greater good. But they had the same pedigree. They really did. They had the same pedigree that I think enabled them to be these barrier breakers. But as we so typically do in our society, we always remember the first guy. We never celebrate the second guy. And if you're number 16, you can pretty much forget it. You know, Perfect. and so here at the Negro Leagues Museum in June, we opened a brand new exhibit after we reopened from being shut down by coronavirus called Barrier Breakers. And the Barrier Breaker exhibit chronicles all the players who broke their respective Major League teams' color barriers from Jackie Robinson in 1947 through Pumps of Green in 1959. And I can tell you now, it didn't get any easier for Pumps of Green in 1959 than it did for Jackie Robinson in 1947. So they all had their trials and tribulations as they were trying to blaze a pathway through their Major League careers. And they deserve to be more than just a footnote in baseball and American history. And so our belief is if we don't tell these stories, who will? Who will? And, and, and a bit of trivia, there were five guys who go up in 1947. Well, everybody knows about Jackie. A few more folks know about Larry Doby breaking the color barrier in the American League. But Hank Thompson, Willett Brown, and Dan Bankhead all – signed with major league teams in 1947. They're the answers to a trivia question. Mm -hmm. and, and Hank Thompson would go on to integrate two major league teams. He would integrate the St. Louis Browns, and then he would go on to integrate the New York Giants, where Hank Thompson, Willie Mays, and the great Monty Irvin, who also played at Hinscliffe, That's right. formed the major's first black outfield with the New York Giants. And then Dan Bankhead is the answer to another trivia question. Who was the first black pitcher in Major League Baseball? It wasn't Satchel Paige, which many believe that it was Satchel Paige. Satchel goes to Cleveland in 1948. Right. It was Dan Bankhead, who was a hard-throwing right-hander uh, in the Negro Leagues, who when he <laughs> got to the Major Leagues could never harness his stuff. And Buck O'Neill always surmised that Dan Bankhead, who was from small town Alabama, was a bit intimidated about what would happen if he hit a white batter and he would not wow. pitch inside. And I don't care how good your stuff is, unless you satchel. Now, satchel is a whole different element. If you can't control the inside part of the plate, you're not going to get guys out in any league, <clears throat> little leagues, major leagues, little league, it doesn't matter. And, and so he could never harness his control. Dan Bankhead would hit the, would, uh, be the first black pitcher to hit a home run. And, and so, yeah, these stories have to be told. Yeah, and so the work that Brian and those guys are doing there at Hinchcliffe is so, so important. And, and of course, it was home to the New York Black Yankees. Correct. Yep, yep, that's right. Um, you know, I, I think the beauty of what you're saying, and I think that's part of baseball as a whole and, and the Negro League specifically, is that you're always learning new information. I think for me, um, are we cutting out here? Can you see me? No. Nope. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, you're always learning new information and, and hearing you speak about Monty Irv and, and Hank Thompson. Okay. I, I've, oh, I love Monty Irv. I got a great, oh, man, I miss him so much. Oh, me too. Actually, I, I'm going to interrupt with the Monty Irvin story real quick. <laughs> Met Monty Irvin years ago at a dinner in Atlantic city. We had a great conversation. I said, Monty, I would love to sit down and, and chat with you about, baseball and your time he goes that he goes that'd be great but i live in houston <laughs> <laughs> he goes if you're ever in houston look me up i said okay turned out i had a, a business trip to houston i called him up i didn't have his number but i found it somehow 
I called him up and he picked it. He goes, hello. And I said, hi, Mr. Urban. I'm Brian Lopinto, et cetera. And he, he kind of remembered who I was. He said, yeah, come on down. What day do you think? And I said, well, how about this day? He said, sure, no problem. I sat down with him. I got to him. He invited me into his home. And he goes, uh, how long do you think this will be? I said, as long as you want. You know, maybe a half hour or so. I was there for about three hours. <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't trying to kick me out either. We just kept talking. And, yeah, no, I know. And, and it was amazing. And, and we spoke about his time at Hinchliffe Stadium because – he actually, prior to Larry Doby, he's a little older than Larry Doby. Yes. Tried out at Hinchliffe Stadium, similar circumstance, maybe not about the umpire, but he tried out for the Newark Eagles at Hinchliffe Stadium in 1937. Right. Similar story, made the ball club, the rest is history. And he told me about his time playing at Hinchliffe Stadium because the Newark Eagles would occasionally play home games at Hinchliffe. And he said what he noticed about that was that – the crowd was intermixed. It was black and white. It didn't, there was, that was the beauty of Hinchliffe Stadium. There was no colored seating as they called it back then. Mm -hmm. uh, the only seating was adult or children. And he also mentioned that the fans were so good in Patterson that they actually kind of got to know them a little bit. Sometimes they would invite the players to their homes for dinner. And sometimes the players would, would agree because it was hard for them to get a home cooked meal when you're constantly traveling and, and, and playing ball games. But Monty Irvin, he's one of my favorite people as well. And to think that he has that connection, then he and Doby were teammates. And then, and you know, that's the thing. You know, he and Doby were teammates on the yep. New York Eagles. And, that's right. and we're talking about two of New Jersey's greatest athletes. Right. These guys were all multi sport athletes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you talked about college. Monty Irvin went to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a Lincoln University here in Missouri as well. Both of them are historically black college and university. Well, Brian, one of the little known facts about the Negro Leagues is that over 40% of its athletes were college educated men. Less than 5% of the major leagues had any college education for the simple reason then the major leagues didn't want you to go to college. They right. got you right out of high school, put you into the farm system, and then you would work your way to the big leagues. Well, the Negro Leagues didn't have that sophisticated farm system. So they would train, spring train, oftentimes on the campuses of historically black college and university. And then they would play the black college baseball teams and then recruited a great deal of their workforce from those HBCUs. So they actually had a disproportionate number of college educated athletes in comparison to the major leagues. Uh huh. But it was the Negro Leagues that were believed to be tramps, hobos, vagabonds, illiterate. Jackie Robinson, Larry Doby walking to dugouts where they were likely the most intellectual beings in those dugouts. Yeah, I'm Amazing. not sure there was another Cleveland Indian or Brooklyn Dodger had stepped foot on a college campus. And, and yeah. so, you know, it is also about breaking down the misnomers and stereotypes that so oftentimes are attached because what we learn about one another we heard it from somebody else. And, and so real quickly about Monty Irvin, and, and I miss him so much. Mm -hmm. My, Monty, I don't know if folks understand that Monty actually was tabbed to be the guy to break baseball's color barrier. The Negro League owners, if someone was going to break the color barrier, they wanted it to be Monty Irvin. Monty Irvin had the exact same pedigree that Jackie Robinson had. Monty Irvin, but Monty Irvin had been a superstar player in the Negro Leagues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish Major League Baseball had gotten Monty Irvin when he was 20, 21 years old. There was right. nothing that Monty Irvin could not do. And, and, and so Monty had served in the military, and that was part of the reason that Monty turned down the opportunity to be the first. Monty had gotten back from World War II, and he was suffering from what we would then call shell shock. Mm -hmm. Today, we would call it post-traumatic syndrome. And he was also having contract squabbles, Brian, with Effa Manley. Who yes, owned she was known for that. <laughs> yeah, no, she owned the Newark Eagles. And, yeah. and, 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 and I'll be frank, y'all, Effa Manley could not stand Branch Rickey. She didn't, she didn't like Branch Rickey because she saw what Branch Rickey was going to do. Rickey was going to come into the Negro Leagues and take players who were under contract away without compensation. And so Ricky had set his sights on Monty Irvin. 
and Ephraim Manley was prepared to fight. Ricky did not need a fight on his hand because he needs to do this very stealth-like because he knew he was going to get opposition from the other owners. So there's no reason in the world to tip off the other owners on what was about to try to go down. Right. And so he backed off of Larry Monty Irvin because Ephraim Manley was prepared to fight. Well, when Bill Veck comes to get Larry Doby, Mrs. Manley says, hell no, if you want it, you will pay me. I think they paid a $15,000 by the time it was all said and done for a future, for a future Hall of Famer, which was a bargain. And, uh -huh, and that's what really happened. Other Negro League owners started selling their star players to the major leagues. Well, here in Kansas City, Branch Rickey turned his sight to Jackie Robinson. And he literally took Jackie Robinson away from the Kansas City Monarchs. But you see, J.L. Wilkinson could not fight back. Wilkinson owned the Kansas City Monarchs. You know why he couldn't fight back? Because Wilkinson was white. Right. Yeah, that Wilkinson was, right. was one of the few white owners in the Negro League. And J.L. Wilkinson had built his entire living in black baseball. His black fan base was tremendously loyal to him. But I can tell you right now, if this white man stands in the way and publicly protests this black man going into the major league, something that every black person in America had been waiting on is over. It's a wrap. He's damned if he did, but he was yep. also damned if he didn't. And, and so publicly, Wilkinson said all the right things. Privately, he's seated. He's not upset because a black man is playing in the major league, but this black man that you're about to take away from me, you're going to put me out of business. Yep. J.L. Wilkinson sold his interest to in the Monarchs to his business partner, T.Y. Baird, the very year after Jackie breaks the color barrier. And real quickly, T.Y. Baird, and I tell people all the time, you can't make this stuff up. It's too good. Mm -hmm. T.Y. Baird, y'all, was a known Kansas City, Kansas Ku Klux Klansman. Oh, yeah, there's, wow. a movie. there's a movie <laughs> waiting to happen. There's a movie waiting to happen. And, and I hope they make me the executive producer. <laughs> is it because you get to walk down the red carpet again? <laughs> uh, that's, that's an amazing thing. That, now, that's, that's a great, now, that's a happy man right there. Look at that picture. Yeah, I was happy. It was cold that day, though, Brian. <laughs> I know. It, it, it was, I mean, you know, that, and it was, to, it was to, I think, to signify the start of the baseball season, which, if you all know, in the Northeast, April is going to be very <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I mean, the, the sliver of sun we found, because you can see that the stadium's in the shade right there. We, I think we all tried to huddle by the, by the sun that day, but that, yeah, that's, uh, that's you right there. Uh, I think when, when Hinchliffe received its, um, its plaque uh, that will be put on the stadium someday, it's not there now, uh, to, to make it a national. <laughs> uh, this is an aerial hit of Hinchliffe Stadium here. Um, this is what Hinchliffe Stadium uh, sadly kind of currently looks like. Um, it's seen better days, uh, but you know, we call it a remarkable survivor of neglect. I want to be very clear with what you actually, can we go back to that previous image if we can? Yeah, thank you very much. So I want to be just clear. I know this is like a, a, it's not really a video. I just wanted to show the image of itself. If you, if you notice to the right, that's um, the baseball diamond as it sits today. That is not where the Negro Leaguers play. Let me be very clear what that is to you. We would be looking at this shot from where they think left field should be. So mm -hmm. the little circle in your upper right, that's home plate. That's right, that's home plate. And you can, you can kind of go around the bases where first is and second, just to give everybody a look. There's first, there's second, there's third. Let me explain that from home plate all the way down to where that arrow is, that's about 500 feet. The other way, if, if I may, if you can go from home plate, that's right. That's about under 200 feet. That's not really good for competitive use. The way the, uh, now, now let's go to the Hinchliffe Stadium aerial from pre-1940. As you can see in this next shot, you don't see the school, which is school five back there. That's a neighborhood back there. There people live right behind the stadium. That, my friends, that is where the Negro Leaguers played their ball games. That's where your Larry Dobies and Monty Irvins tried out. That's where Cool Papa Bell played. That's where Josh Gibson hit a home run 
1934 to break the New York Black Yankees eight game winning streak. And the game ended in rain too. But anyway, this is the home plate that, uh, that the Negro Leaguers played in. This is exactly where Hinchliffe Stadium should return its home plate. Currently right now, for whatever reason, there are people in Patterson that don't seem to understand the importance, and it's, it's symbolic, but it's beyond symbolic, of returning home plate to where these great players played. And I say this because I said this earlier. If it wasn't for the Negro Leagues, we could not save the stadium. No. So if that is in fact the case, you have to return home plate. There's something just, it, it's something that we yeah. call historic preservation intangible value. Yeah. And imagine, if you will, a young African-American ball player from Eastside or Kennedy High School in Patterson standing in the same location. Sure, it's going to be a turf field, fine. But the same location where Larry Doby once stood, a fellow townsman, in, in one of your, your videos for the Negro League Museum, walking the same streets. The, those are the same streets that Larry Doby walked. Yeah. And to say that you're not going to return home plate to where it should be, because it just makes no sense to me. I, I, I think you would agree with me that that's what should happen. And I'm hopeful that maybe with this conversation here and with those of us that are watching live now and maybe into the future on, on, on rebroadcasts, that maybe we can start a movement to, to petition and say, okay, we need to get this done right. Because if you go to Hinchliffe Stadium and you're touring it and they say, well, Oh, is that the baseball field where, they, where the Negro Leaguers played? on? No, it's not there. It's somewhere over there. You're going to lose people. Remember, it's within the boundaries of a national park. There's a certain level of expectations when you go to the national park. And, and those great folks who work uh, in Patterson, they do a great job. Darren Bach, Elise, and all those folks. We have to do right by the history. And it would be even better for competitive play. So if you don't even want to think about the history, just from a baseball perspective, you're better off having two short you know, alleyways down left and right than having one long and short. So I'm hopeful people out there will support that. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think, Brian, authenticity is so extremely important. So even as Buck O'Neill was making the cognizant decision to keep the Negro Leagues Museum here, to build it here at a time when there was nothing here, as I tell people all the time, yeah, we could have moved the museum. But man, you cannot move this history. The history doesn't go, go along with it. You know, as you mentioned, when you walk these streets, you walk in the same streets that those legendary ball players walk and those legendary jazz artists, they all walk these streets. Mm -hmm. You can't yep. take that with you. And, and so authenticity, I think, is vitally important. I, I hope the, 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 you know all of those who are going to be involved in this project will hear you loud and clear. On, on what you're saying there, because that is significant. You mentioned a name, and, and if, I, if, if you guys will indulge me, I'll run through just a few of some of these great stars who came out of the Negro Leagues. You just mentioned that Josh Gibson hit a home run there in his cliff. And he hit him everywhere. <laughs> he hit him everywhere. I was about to say, and I saw that house behind the stadium. He might have gotten it, because Josh Gibson, guys, Josh Gibson, they refer to Gibson as the Black Babe Ruth. And I tell people all the time, as you look at that picture, you can see the power in the photograph. Yeah, you know, he had this mythical-like power, but all oh, the power was very real. And, and, and folks, he swung a 40-ounce, 40 41-inch bat, and look where he's got it gripped. He's got it <laughs> gripped down below the knob. Big, powerful forearms, big, powerful thighs. Had that trademark rolled up left sleeve showing off those guns. But yep. great, great eyes. My dear friend, the late, great Buck O'Neill, would describe Gibson in this manner, that he had the eyes of Ted Williams and the power of Babe Ruth rolled into one dynamic package. Yeah, his outs, as they say, were loud outs. And, and of course, they call Gibson the Black Babe Ruth. But there are others who saw Gibson play who will call Ruth the White Josh Gibson. Now, the man was incredible. He is still believed to be the only man to ever hit a ball completely out of Yankee Stadium. He hit one in the polo grounds there in New York that they estimated to travel over 600 feet. 
And as I tell my visitors all the time when they come here to the Negro Leagues Museum, his steroids, ham hocks, and collard greens. Yeah, the man <laughs> was just country strong, as we say, from Georgia. And, and, and another name that played that his clip, Oscar Charleston, the great Oscar Charleston. Oscar Charleston is most believed to be the greatest baseball player of all time. Buck O'Neill thought he was the absolute best baseball player he ever saw. Now, Buck thought Willie Mays to be the greatest major leaguer, and, and most people concur, because Willie Mays could beat you every way in which you could be beaten. He could beat you with his bat, with his arms, with his legs, with his glove, and of course, Willie Mays' illustrious career began in the Negro League with the Birmingham Black Baron. But Buck believed that man, Oscar Charleston, to be the greatest baseball player he ever saw. Oscar Charleston, guys, was an early era Negro Leaguer who could do it all. The consummate five-tool guy. Hit for power, hit for average, could feel, could run, could throw. In 1921, he led the Negro Leagues in home runs, triples, doubles, stolen bases, and batting average in the same season. If you were going to compare him to a major league contemporary, he had the defensive abilities of Trish Speaker, the tenacity of Ty Cobb, and the bat of Babe Ruth rolled into one dynamic package. And, and I think next on our list is the great Cool Papa Bell. First and foremost, the greatest nickname in baseball history, bar none. Cool Papa is still believed to be the fastest man to ever play this game. Clocked him in an amazing 12 seconds circling the bases from home to home. His good friend Satchel Page would say of Cool that he was so fast, he could walk <laughs> in a room, turn off the lights, get in bed, pull up the covers before the room went dark. But as I tell people all the time, you don't have to fictionalize the speed of Cool Papa Bell. Cool Papa Bell once stole 175 bases in a less than 200 game season. He twice, honest to God's truth, twice scored from first base on a bunt in exhibition games against Major League All-Stars. See, plays like the bunt and run, hit and run, were created, perfected in the Negro League, later picked up by Major League Baseball. And speaking of the legendary Leroy Satchel Page, arguably the greatest pitcher this sport has ever seen. We know for certain he was the oldest rookie in the history of Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball says that Satchel was 42 years old when he got his opportunity to play for the Cleveland Indians in 1948 as a rookie. You might remember, Brian, you talked about it earlier. Satchel and Larry Doby would lead the Cleveland Indians to, to win the 1948 World Series. Yep. Now, my Indian fans get tired of hearing me say this, but that was the last time Cleveland won the World Series was That's with right. Satchel Page and Larry Doby. And many thought Satchel, and there's Satchel with Jackie Robinson, they were teammates here in Kansas City in 1945. <clears throat> many thought Satchel should have been named Rookie of the Year. He goes 6-1 and one with a 2.4 ERA, his rookie season at age 42, which oh. means he was likely closer to 52. Satchel never told his real age. And quite frankly, guys, I don't think Satchel knew his real age. And, and that's not far-fetched. As I share with my young audience, there were so many in the Deep South in particular who did not know how old they were. And so baseball says that Satchel was born July 7th, 1906, which I absolutely do not believe. <laughs> the man that died here in 1982, he had seen 76 a long time ago. Satchel was likely born until the early to mid-1890s in Mobile, Alabama. And like most who were born of that era, everybody's born at home to a midwife. So that birth record was kept in the family Bible. And it might be days, months, weeks, years, if ever, it was taken to the courthouse and officially recorded as a birth record. Uh -huh. And according to Satchel, the goat ate that page out the Bible. So he did not know. 
And as Satchel would so whimsically say, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you were? Or that age is simply mind over matter. Yeah. If you don't mind, it don't matter. And guys, that is how he led his life in his prime. They clocked his fastball at 105 miles per hour. But what really made Satchel so special, and Brian, as you well know, 105 mm -hmm. is pretty doggone special. But oh, what yeah. really made Satchel so special was 105 with pinpoint control. He could put it exactly where he wanted to put it. And guys, we're not talking about just throwing strikes. Uh-uh. The catcher set the target. He hit the target. He didn't <laughs> miss. He didn't miss. He didn't warm up in the bullpen like most pitchers do throwing across home plate to the catcher. Not Satchel. He would use a stick of foil chewing gum wrapper. The catcher would set the chewing gum wrapper on top of home plate. And wherever the catcher moved the chewing gum wrapper, satchel right over the top of that chewing gum wrapper. I tell my guests all the time, there will never, ever, ever be another Leroy Satchel page. Not someone who combines the longevity, the great stuff, by his estimation, pitched in over 2,600 games, recorded some 55 no-hitters, and only God knows how many strikeouts, and the charisma. He could sell it, but Brian, he could back it up. And guys, Satchel had names for his pitches. So he didn't have fastball, curveball, changeup. No, not Satchel. Satchel had what he called his midnight creeper. He had the two-humper, the bat dodger, the hesitation pitch, <laughs> the long tom, the short tom, the jump ball, the trouble ball, the radio ball, the wobbly ball, the dipsy do. And he also had a pitch called the B ball. You know why he called it the B ball? Why is that? Because Satchel says, it bees where I want it to be when I want it to be there. <laughs> and so he had everything that you needed to be a star. And in many ways, he was the star of the Negro Leagues. And was he a little hurt when Jackie got called before him? Of course he was, because he was the Negro League's biggest star. Uh-huh, but yep. yeah, but there's no way that they were going to take Satchel because all the other owners would have said, you're too old. Uh-huh, Bill Veck is the only guy that would have given Satchel an opportunity. And to be honest, I don't know if Bill Veck knew that the old man still had some gas in the tank, but the old man still had some gas in the tank. Yeah. Anyway, that's a few of the great stars of the Negro Leagues. I know we want to save some time. Oh, yeah, El Maestro, Martin De Higo. Yeah. Yeah, Martin De Higo from Cuba. Nicknamed him El Maestro, the master, because he played, he could do everything. He played all nine positions, played all nine of them well. He is the only baseball player in the history of our sport to be enshrined into five different countries' baseball halls of fame. He's in the yep. Mexican, Cuban, Venezuelan, Dominican, and in Cooperstown. Yeah, it's amazing to think that most folk have not heard of this name, Martin De Higo, when he is easily one of the greatest baseball players of all time. Absolutely. Um, Martin De Higo, he, he, uh, the New York Cubans played at Hinchliffe Stadium in right. 1935 and a very large part of 1936. And he took the hill at Hinchliffe Stadium on a number of occasions. And in my research, I saw him playing second base, parts of the outfield. And I don't think it mattered. He was going to play somewhere. The most versatile player ever. He was going to be ever. somewhere else. Yeah. That's no, right. most versatile player ever. One year in the Mexican League, Brian, the Higo wins the pitching title. He goes 19-2 and two with an 0.90 wow. ERA. The sucker hits 387 that same season and won the batting title, man. That makes no ah. sense. <laughs> man, it's like, how do you have all the time to do that? Man, and most guys these days, right? You pitch five innings, you get four, you get, you know, five or six days. <laughs> and they don't bat now with the universal DH this year. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, you know? But no, it, these leagues were special. They're special, and the work that you and those in Patterson are doing to restore Hinchcliffe is a special part of keeping the legacy of the Negro Leagues alive. We that. commend you guys for the work that you're doing. 
uh, because again, I look at Hinchcliffe Stadium the same way as I look at the Paseo YMCA or League Park or Rickwood Field uh, or Hamtramck Stadium. These are artifacts. And, and they are some of the most significant artifacts left from the Negro Leagues. Right. And, and we have to protect them. We I, I totally agree. We have to protect them. So yeah. as we embark on a year-long 100th anniversary celebration, recognizing the Negro Leagues for what it meant both on and off the field. And it's the off the field aspect that I think people don't always grasp. Because as we prepare to move into Q&A, this is a story that is so much bigger than baseball. This is a story about economic empowerment, the importance of economic empowerment. This is a story about an unprecedented level of leadership that emerged as a result of the formation of these leagues. And then ultimately, this is the story of the social advancement of America as Jackie Robinson is handpicked from the great Kansas City Monarchs to be baseball's chosen one, to break its six decade long self-imposed color barrier. And folks, there is no question that Jackie Robinson's breaking of the color barrier wasn't just a part of the civil rights movement, it was the beginning of the civil rights movement in this country. Remember now, this is 1947. This is well before those more noted civil rights occurrences. This is before Brown versus the Board of Education. This is before Rosa Parks' refusal to move to the back of the bus. As my, my dear friend, the late great John Buck O'Neill would so eloquently say, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was only a sophomore at Morehouse College when Robinson signed his contract to play in the Dodgers organization. President Truman would not integrate the armed forces until a year after Jackie. So for all intents and purposes, this is what started the ball of social progress rolling in our country, baseball. And our country literally jumped on the coattail of baseball. So while Major League Baseball had been vilified, for not allowing Blacks to play. When it opened its door, our country followed suit. It speaks to the reverence that baseball held, and I still think still holds in our society. And so as we continue to deal with these issues in and around systematic racism and social injustice, it is vitally important that baseball again be at the forefront of dealing with this issue as we try to blaze a pathway to equality for all of our citizens in this great country. Absolutely. Perfectly put. It really was. You know, you, 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 you know, it, it's funny to think, not funny, but it's just to think about the, you know, when the military, you're, you're talking about that before, African-Americans and, and hopefully everyone are, are familiar with the uh, Tuskegee Airmen, you know, you can serve your country, but you can't play baseball at the highest level. Baseball. You explain that to me, you know. Oh, I guess. And, and really, Brian, that was the sentiment. I think if you were going to point to any single solitary event that led to the integration of baseball, it is exactly what you just touched on, World War II. Because right. you did have that sentiment of the fact that you had these young African-American soldiers dying, fighting for their country, fighting essentially the same racism in another country but that you got that you got to take here at home, mm -hmm. but you can't play baseball in this country. And that's where that groundswell started to occur. The belief was if they can die fighting for their country, they ought to be able to play baseball in this country. Right. Absolutely. I know when um when the Dodgers signed Larry Doby, this is I'm sorry, uh, Jackie Robinson, Larry Doby was serving in the Pacific and he heard it over a transistor radio that the Dodgers signed Jackie and their plans to play them in Montreal. So it's kind of interesting how that's all intertwined because they both served our country as well. Yeah, yeah. No, it's fascinating. So uh, I guess now we're going to turn it over to Q&A and I hope you guys yes, have we, some we, questions for us. We've got some questions. I, I want to throw out a question and then I also have a question for you, Bob. So I wanted to throw out a question of if any of our audience has stories that from their family that have been passed down Either they've met one of the players or their, their family members went to some of the games. You know, raise your hand. I'd love to hear some of that. And also, Bob, you were um, 
telling us about Gus Greenlee. Yes. So if you could tell a little bit about that, it would be amazing. Yeah, no, Gus Greenlee is really the guy who is responsible for re reviving the Negro Leagues after it had died, like a lot of businesses in this country at, during the Great Depression. And so when you look at, from an ownership standpoint, it starts with Ruth Foster, or from an executive standpoint, it starts with Ruth Foster, and then it transitions to Gus Greenlee, and then later Effa Manley. But Gus Greenlee would create the East-West All-Star Game, debuted in 1933, the same year as Major League Baseball's All-Star Game. And folks, yes, it did outdraw Major League Baseball's All-Star Game. They would hold, hold their all-star game every year at Chicago's Comiskey Park. And they would put over 50,000 fans into Chicago's Comiskey Park. There's Gus Greenlee's 1935 Pittsburgh Crawford. Gus Green, that 35 Pittsburgh Crawford team, many believe to be the greatest baseball team ever assembled. Five future Hall of Famers playing in their prime on that team. That team had... Satchel Page, Cool Papa Bell, Judy Johnson, Josh Gibson, and Oscar Charleston on the same team. It was a dynamite team. And, and, and basically, Gus Greenley raided his neighbor, the Homestead Grays, and, and basically outbid for that talent. Gus Greenley had a lot of money. Gus Greenley was a uh, numbers guy. He ran the numbers. Uh, and of course, the numbers ain't nothing but the lottery. But, you know, it was illegal at that time. I don't know why, but it was. And, and so, but Gus Greenlee used that re those resources to finance his own team. Matter of fact, he built his own stadium in Pittsburgh called Greenlee Field. Paid $100,000 in 1931 to build his own stadium. $100,000 is a lot of money now, but $100,000 in 1931 was a whole lot of money. And, and so Greenlee, as the kids would say, was a baller. <laughs> hey, hey, Bob, a quick question about Gus Greenlee. W was he ever involved with Prohibition as well? Because I know that was right around the same time. Did he boot, did all the bootlegging and all that stuff? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. You know, he, he, up on the hill there in yep. Pittsburgh. And, uh, you know, the hill was jumping. And, yeah. and it was a lot like 18 to 5. You know, mm -hmm. it was Prohibition, but there was no Prohibition at 18 to 5. <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. I mean, to, to the credit of, I think, the, either the state of Pennsylvania or the, or the city of Pittsburgh, there are markers there indicating where those locations. I walked to both of them. I had to just to see yeah. what it was like, even if right. it's a marker. But we don't want markers. We want to have rehabilitation oh, of Hamtramck and, and, and yeah. of course, the Paseo YMCA, which you guys are doing a great job. Yeah. With. That's awesome. So we have a question from Jeff Cohen. Let's see if we can unmute him. Can you hear me? You, we can. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Brian. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Hey, Jeff. Uh, How you doing, man? Bob, uh, Jeff from uh, Baseball Barbecue. Thank you for this yes, program. Sir. This is great. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys, can you speak to the contributions of Cumberland Posey? Well, Cumberland Posey uh, and the great homes are great. I mean, Cumberland Posey was a major force and a major influence in this game and had a tremendous impact. You know, we talked about, you know, we talked about that 35 Pittsburgh Crawford, but that 1931 Homestead Grace, others will say that that was the greatest baseball team ever assembled. And, and, and Con Posey, an extraordinarily gifted athlete. Uh, and so, yeah, he has a tremendous influence on the game uh, overall. And, and so as, it, you know, eventually those Homestead Grays, and you see that Grays photograph there, that is of them playing in Washington when they were playing, when they had moved and left the Pittsburgh area to move to D.C. and started playing their home games at Griffith Stadium. And man, they were outdrawing the Washington Senators. And, and so, but no, Jeff, you're right. Uh, Con Posey plays a tremendous part in this story. Thank you. So we have a question or comment from Ralph Carhart. I'm going to unmute you now, Ralph. Uh, thanks. Um, I, well, I have a question for Brian about uh, uh, Hinchliff, but I actually wanted to just tag on to something that Bob had mentioned since we brought up Composey, uh, is that his business partner uh, was actually a guy by the name of Sonny Man Jackson, who was also um, one of those um, nefarious dealers of alcohol <laughs> in an inappropriate time. 
Um, although I think, Bob, am I wrong in saying that Cum himself sort of stayed here, kept he his did. hands clear of all of that, he right? He, he was clean yeah, of that. He let Sonny Man take care of the dirty work. Um, Brian, my question for you is, I know there's been a lot of legal wrangling going on in the restoration. Right. Um, what's the, uh, but we've had good news of late. So what's the, the now realistic timeline for that to be usable <laughs> by, the, by the local youth? Well, that's a great question. Um, for those of you that are aware, I've been a part of this for some time. So I guess I'll start with saying, I'll believe it when I see it. But supposedly, uh, there should be construction starting this fall uh, toward the rehabilitation of Hinchliffe Stadium with the goal to have it open by the year 2022. Not sure what point in the year that might be. But again, I'll believe that when I see it. There's a lot of moving parts. I know that they have to work with uh, some tax credits. We wonder how coronavirus might, might factor that in if some things might get delayed. So the current plan, start construction at some point this fall, which is very soon, and with the hopes that... Uh, that we have a, a grand reopening, if I may say, uh, in 2022. So that's that's what we're looking forward to. That's what we're hoping for. But again, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> no, I hope to be there. Oh, me too. Thank you very much. We have a, um, a comment that you guys can speak to um, from Doug Walters, who said, we all know during the war, there was an all women's league, mm -hmm. Mamie Peanut Johnson, who pitched for the Indianapolis Clowns. Would it be um, accurate to say that she broke the gender barrier and was the first to pitch in a male-dominated league? Yes, yeah, she was the first to pitch. She wasn't the first woman, though, to play professional baseball in, with the men. That distinction goes to Tony Stone. So Mamie was one of three women who played in the Negro Leagues who competed with and against the men in the 1950s in the Negro Leagues, but they, they were led by the great Tony Stone. Uh, who a wonderful off-Broadway play was just done on her life last year is magnificent. Tony Stone and then Mamie Peanut Johnson, who was a five-foot-three-inch pitcher with a strong right arm, and, and then Connie Morgan. Mamie Johnson was the only one of the women that wanted to try out for the All-American Girls Professional League and, of course, was denied because Black women were also excluded from that league. That's one of the reasons why I think if you remember the film A League of Their Own, I really believe that's why Penny Marshall put that scene in where the sister picks up the ball and fires it back to Gina Davis on the mound and everybody's looking like stunned. I think that was her nod to Mamie Peanut Johnson, you know, and to let, let people know that Black women had been excluded from that All-American Girls Professional League as well. But there were three pioneering women in Tony Stone, Mamie Johnson, and of course, Connie Morgan, uh, who competed with and against the men in the 1950s. Interesting enough, interesting fact, Tony Stone took the roster place of a name that you probably have heard before, Henry Aaron. Yeah, the Boston Braves had signed Henry Aaron away from the Indianapolis Clowns in 1952. And the Clowns signed Tony Stone the next year to take his roster place. <laughs> I have a I have a follow up question about that. Um, uh, you brought up the character of Effa Manley a couple of times, and and I love her story and 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 the idea that there was this you know powerful, um, active, incredible Ooh. businesswoman. But what is what is the time? Um, what is what is the timeline like in comparing Tony Stone to Effa Manley? Who happened when in relationship to each first. other? Effa Manley is first. Effa Manley is in did the they fourth. did they come across each other at all? Oh, possibly, possibly. But you know, Newark, the Newark Eagles. The minute Jackie took the field with the Brooklyn Dodgers it was almost over for them. So the reason Brian and Monty was in Houston is that they moved the team to Houston. And I think he fell in love with Houston. And, and so Monty talked about it. You know, their fan base that had been so loyal to them, the minute Jackie breaks the color barrier, they all left Newark to go over to Brooklyn to see Jackie. And, and that's what you saw throughout the Negro Leagues because Black fans had been waiting to see how their Black stars were going to fare. Tony Stone comes in in 1953. So the Eagles are no, no longer in existence 
at, at that time. And so when she joins, it was really kind of an effort by the clowns to try and appeal to a female base, fan base. Uh-huh. And, and Tony Stone and Connie Morgan and Mamie Johnson were all gifted athletes. Uh, but there certainly was a marketing element to this as well, as they were trying to attract the new audience, and they did. Women flocked to see Tony and Mamie and Connie play. But the crossover between Tony and Effa, they may have at some point known each other, but the Newark Eagles were done by the time that Tony comes into the league. Incredible. We have a question from Leonard Aberman. Um, maybe we can unmute Leonard. Sorry, technology still escapes me. <laughs> <laughs> so I am also from the podcast Baseball and Barbecue uh, with Jeff Cohen. This is not meant to promote at all. I would just like to say uh, we love baseball history. And I have to, anytime that I see this gentleman, Bob Kendrick, <laughs> I have to say something. He is an incredible human being. And he's been on our show a couple of times. I know what he does for baseball, uh, for the Negro Leagues uh, history. And I just wanna tell you that I thoroughly enjoy you every time I hear you, every time I see you. I am so thrilled that, you know, indirectly we, we, we you know, that we've crossed paths, that you've been with us on our show. We just think the world of you Anyone that ever listens to our, our show and hears you has nothing but positive things to say. And Brian, I, I, I'm so thrilled to see you as well because I think that preserving baseball history is so important. But I, I just, yes, and, and I, but I just want you to know that Bob, you are just a beautiful human being. Thank you. And, and we just, we thank you for doing this and and you're terrific so i just wanted you to know that i appreciate that thank you so much man. i i agree i'm tipping my cap to you right now 100 <laughs> percent. i've known you i know you for many years and we've we, a lot of it's been email communications and you've been nothing but a gentleman and and enthusiastic should we show that picture of that enthusiastic man <laughs> looks like, look like you tapped into your like eight or nine year old self you look, i've never seen anybody happier at Hinchliff because <laughs> I go there, I'm not that happy. <laughs> uh, it was hard, hard to find that joy as cold as it was that day. Though, but I know, hard. I know. <laughs> so talk about the, the tip of the hat so that people can yeah. continue that. that yeah, and, and you know, Stephanie, it was a crazy idea that I came up with out of necessity, really, because so many of our year-long 100th anniversary plans have been really derailed by coronavirus. And June 27th of this year was supposed to be our National Day of Recognition with Major League Baseball. And so the, old, the idea of doing a tip, of, tip your cap to the Negro Leagues was going to take place with fans and players inside all the stadiums. Well, it became clear and apparent that there was no, not going to be baseball played on June 27th. At that point in time, we didn't even know if baseball was going to be played. And so I was just trying to find a way to breathe some life back into this celebration. And so I came up with this notion of doing a virtual tip your cap to the Negro Leagues. And so as I so oftentimes do when I have a crazy idea, I call my good friend Joe Posnanski, the great writer. And Joe and I have been friends for so long. Uh, we, we, we refer to each other as brothers, although we, we're not biological brothers, we are bonded like brothers. And so I called Joe and I said, well, Joe, I got this crazy idea to see if we can do a virtual tip your cap to the Negro League. See if we can get fans, dignitaries, and others to take pictures of themselves, a short video, post them to a website, uh, and see if we can get some folks to, to do this. So I'm waiting for him to tell me, Bob, that's a crazy idea, forget about it. He didn't say that was a crazy idea. Matter of fact, he said, it's a great idea. And then he reached out to his business partner, a guy named Dan McGinn, who is a tremendous communication strategist out of the DC area. Dan thought it was a great idea. 
And the three of us went to work about a week before the June 27th tip your cap would have happened in stadium. On June 29th of this year, we rolled out the campaign. And when we rolled it out, we rolled it out with four US presidents tipping their cap. President Obama, President Bush, President Clinton, and President Jimmy Carter, all tipping their cap to the Negro Leagues. General Colin Powell, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Billie Jean King, Bob Costas, Conan O'Brien, Conan, uh, Conan Stephen Colbert, uh, The Temptations. <laughs> but then when we went into outer space, literally into outer space, and got a tip of the cap from astronaut Chris Cassidy, who was aboard the International Space Shuttle, I knew then that we had something that was pretty doggone special. And you saw this on all the national shows and, and, and it just took off. And it literally went from a campaign to a movement. And I'll be honest, I did not anticipate it being received that way. You don't set out to say that something is going to go viral. You just wanted to put together a very thought provoking effort that might get people to join in on what you're trying to do. And of course, for those of you who know our sport, there's nothing more honorable than a simple tip of the cap. It is the ultimate show of respect. And, and this thing just resonated. But you know what, Stephanie? I also think that our country needed that at that point in time. You know, dealing with the coronavirus pandemic and then dealing with the level of social unrest that was so reminiscent of the 1960s. So we had seen this divisiveness in our country. And, and I think we needed something that we could rally around. And, and the Tip Your Cap campaign comes along at the absolute perfect time. And for me, it warms my heart that the winning spirit of the Negro Leagues could unite people in that manner. And for those of you, you know, the website is still up. You can go to tippingyourcap.com to see all the folks who have participated in the project. You can also take a picture or a video of yourself, tipping your cap, and, and you can post it at, at, at tippingyourcap.com. So when you go to the website, you can see the place to, go, to upload your photograph or a video, and we're still accepting them. We were going to initially end the campaign as baseball season came back. It was our way to welcome baseball back. And, but it, because it was so well received, we're just going to keep the site going through the end of this 100th anniversary year. That's great. That is so That's awesome. Amazing. Also, uh, so I have a question for yeah. you. Sorry, Stephanie, would you like to? Uh... I, just, I just like the stories that you tell are so inspirational in that I feel like generations, I want to look up to these people to take action, what I can do socially from what they have gone through is amazing. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, that, that kind of leads to my question. And, you know, they say sports and politics don't mix, but we all know that's really, really not true. Um, <laughs> and, it, you know, uh, and, and I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective, you know, we're talking about impacting current generations and we're, we're talking about all the current unrest and and my question for you, you know, thinking of, of um, all of the sports teams who are, are making statements, political statements with their um, conduct, um, integration of um, baseball, integration in sports, is the job done? Or is there still more work to do? Well, there's still, there's still more work to do. There really is, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit disheartening, some of the things that we're seeing in our society right now. Uh, the fact that those who have been marginalized, uh, particularly in their efforts for equality. You see, when we, when Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier, he creates integration in our society. That is really what sparked integration in our society. It didn't bring us equality. And, and we quickly found that the two are not the same. Yeah, the two are definitely not the same. And so there's still this constant quest for equality. 
And so even though I may not have as much as you may have, I shouldn't be treated less than. You know, and I think that's where we have to continue to evolve as a society. So, I, I, I mean, I feel with tremendous pride to see these young athletes step up and try to use their platform to call attention to an issue that has been an issue for a long time. It has just become on top of mind now because we've seen two people very vividly lose their lives, you know, right in front of our eyes. Well, not, well, one loses life one paralyzed now, you know, of what ha has occurred here recently. And, and, and we know that we've got to be better than this. And we have to continue to challenge our country to be better, just as we as human beings every single day are trying to become better. We all are trying to be better. We have to also challenge our great country to continue to be great. And, and until everybody has the exact same rights, the, the opportunity to pursue justice the way that it is supposed to be, then we still got work to do. We deal with it here on a segregated basis. So when our children come into the museum, they experience a segregated society for the first time. And, and, and it blows them away. They cannot believe that our country was that backwards that it once operated that way. And segregation, guys, summarized through the eyes of a child is done so very simply. That was dumb. And they're right. It was dumb. But it was also the way that our country was. And, and, and while we have grown leaps and bounds, we still have a long way to go. Yeah, we've got to keep the dialogue going and we've got to keep pushing from a legislative standpoint to change the system. I may not change your heart. You know, it's quite possible I won't ever change your heart. You know, if you see me and all you see is my black skin, then I'm probably not gonna change your heart. But I can change the systems that allow for people to do these things without any accountability. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, Jerry Smith, who is a current head coach of NJCU. Do you want to um, unmute Jerry and kind of ask your question? Because it's amazing. Hey guys, thanks uh, for everybody who put this together, especially uh, um, Bob and Brian for what you guys enlightened us on. But um, currently when, at NJCU, we play on the site of Roosevelt Stadium and I know it, it appeared in uh, the movie 42. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jackie Robinson started his AAA career there, had like a four for five day. And I know Monte Urban played there as well. I would like to educate my guys if you know of any other events that happened at, at Roosevelt mm -hmm. Stadium. I know it wasn't Negro Leagues. I know it was a AAA for the Giants, but I don't know if there's anything else that came there were, I, I'm sure there were a litany of Negro League stars who, who came through those ranks who likely played there then. Yeah, there's no question about that. But man, you just named two great ones. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know that in, in the latter part of the stadium's history, talking about, I think, 1978, Ricky Henderson actually played there. Right there, yeah. They can, uh, the team was, they were the Jersey City A's. They were an Oakland Athletics minor league team. Very far from Oakland, not Oakland, New Jersey. But I know Ricky Henderson played at Roosevelt Stadium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from the research I did, it looked like Monty Irvin played his AAA ball there. That was his home team. and right. Um, and then the other question I had was with the reopening of Hinchcliffe, um, what are the dimensions going to be? Because in the future, if we could get a game with Rutgers, Newark or William Patterson and host a college game there, I mean, I know you mentioned the 200 feet to right and 500 feet to left. What were the dimensions if it gets set up the way the Negro League was set up? Well, that's, I'm glad you asked that question because I was eventually going to bring that up. If uh, we can, uh, Please, uh, Anna, if you can bring up the, the picture of the polo grounds. I would like to kind of uh, share that if I can uh, with the group. Uh, many people ask me what Major League Stadium did Hen Hinchliffe Stadium kind of replicate? And, and if you look side by side on the left, Hinchliffe Stadium, on the right, polo grounds. This would be, you know, again, what, what these would be, I'm giving you an estimation. I hope that home plate does get returned to the appropriate historic location. 
Left field, right field would be rather short, approximately maybe 280 feet down the line with a deep center field. Much more palatable, and I hope you would agree with me as a head coach, rather than having a 500-foot uh, left field and, a, and a maybe about 200 feet to right. You want to have some sort of equity in baseball, and I understand that baseball, you have different dimensions and different ballparks, but that's why you have ground rules, and that's why returning uh, to Hinchliffe Stadium, the old historic uh, home plate, would be great for your ball clubs, uh, would be great to maybe have a once-a-year minor league game, um, with the New Jersey Jackals and maybe the Sussex County Miners, just as they do at Rickwood Field. In fact, the owner of, uh, is the same person on both of those teams. He's originally from Patterson. His name is Al Dorso. I never met him. But I think there's a lot of opportunity to put it, uh, to have uh, something special by returning it there, maybe even something like a College Wood Bat League, which, which is very uh, successful in, at Cape Cod. But that home plate has to return to its original Negro League location for so many reasons. But We'll see what the dimensions are. The last thing I heard is they want to put two baseball diamonds there. The diamond that you see here and the one, if you want to show that other picture where it says Hinchliffe now, um, the one that's there. And we can show that again if you'd like. Um, and that's just not appropriate for, for use. What you're looking at there is, uh, yeah, you can go back to that if you want. Um, again, it's, it, it's one of these situations where that's just not good for competitive use in my opinion. Yeah, in, in uh, 2022 and 2023, you let us know we would definitely be interested in hosting a game there, for sure. That, and that's wonderful. And, and that's what this forum is so important, to, to get to people such as yourself who have an interest, who have the ability. And I know that we could work through something like that. I think that would be great. Having William Patterson uh, uh, play NJCU at a game and, and really revisiting that, I think that would be tremendous. It really would be. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. This, uh, this actually is, is a rendering that I did want to show. And I, this is just a little bit of what the exterior would look like. Um, this would be against the player's entrance to your left. Those windows would represent the locker rooms. Imagine, again, like we, we've been talking about Josh Gibson quite a bit. Pittsburgh, not that far from Patterson. So uh, the, the, the Crawfords play there quite a bit. Imagine the bus driving up there and and Josh Gibson getting off the bus to go into the locker room to get ready for the game. Those locker rooms will be restored from my understanding to, to the way they, they look like back then. I hope that's going to be the case. To your right, I want to bring this to your attention. That is a new structure. That is going to be a two-building, a two-story structure. The hopes is to have entertainment space so that you can lease out for various parties, and there's going to be exhibit space. One thing that I, I kind of want to put out there, and, and Bob, what you guys have done with the Paseo, uh, with, with the Negro Leagues Museum, I don't know what the future in your mind is of the Negro Leagues Museum. If you're looking to spread your wings, I can't say this enough. I, 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 if I could wave a magic wand, I would say that a Negro Leagues annex at mm -hmm. a Negro League stadium is just would be jaw dropping for everybody. Oh, and mind you that that Negro League potential museum and the stadium is within the boundaries of a national park. Yeah. What great symmetry. I'm wondering, is that something that you think might be viable at all? In, in, yeah, no, I, I, I do because we're having similar conversations, you know, in our efforts to try to bring Major League Baseball to Nashville, where the sure. team is called the Nashville Stars. And building a museum there at the new ballpark that will look at that area and or region's history. I think we have the same opportunity to do that there in Patterson to look at that regional history. Uh, and for us, the opportunity to build what I would refer to as satellite exhibitions is very important with all roads leading back to Kansas City for the national story. So yeah, no, there, that makes sense. You know, uh, the, the, the quest to try and pull together artifacts and those kinds of things is where the real challenge, but there are other creative ways to bring the stories to life. Absolutely. And, and the National Park Service, they've been great partners. They actually produced uh, two films, one about Hinchliffe Stadium and one about the life of Larry Doby. So, mm. you know, when, when, when that time comes, yeah, we love to talk. let me know uh, because yeah. I know these folks quite well. And I know that they, they love the work that you do. Uh, they're, they're very familiar. I know Darren Bach, the head of that uh, organization, he, he loves baseball and is, has been very much interested in the work that you have been doing. So 
I think I think I think it makes sense. And the beauty is that the building will already be built. So exactly half the battle in, in some in some cases. Exactly. You know, so I, you know, let, we can talk about that going down forward. But uh, okay, but if I could wave that magic wand, it just I can see it. I can almost see it right now. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we have a last question from um, Doug Walters, who asked um, that Buck O'Neill's nickname Nancy was given to him by Satchel. Is that a true story? That is a true story. Satchel did give Buck the nickname Nancy, and the the I guess the uh, not so long winded version of it is that Buck got his good friend out of a predicament uh, and Satchel nicknamed him Nancy and he was Nancy until the day he died. Uh, and of course, Buck became Satchel's wingman. So this story involved Satchel and, and a, a woman that Satchel didn't have any business uh, talking to. <laughs> but uh, Buck got him out of a little hot water, and he got stuck with the nickname Nancy. And he was Nancy from that day on to Satchel. But yes, oh, Satchel did. Satchel did uh, stick the nickname Nancy on Buck. That's that's interesting because I I know that uh, in 1948, Larry Doby and Satchel Page were roommates. Obviously, as the only two African American, yes. they're probably going to do that, right? Uh, of course. And and there and and apparently. The way the story goes, Larry Doby was just fine with that because he really just roomated. Uh, the roommate was actually just his luggage because apparently Satchel Page had a Mrs. Page in every American. <laughs> um, I think Doby was fine um, with uh, with just kind of sharing his luggage. <laughs> well, Bob and Brian, I thank you so much. It's an amazing program. Um, if you can um, tell people where they can get in touch with you. That would be awesome. And then I'll kind of talk about our next programs coming up. Well, if you want to learn more about the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, please visit us online at www.nlbm.com. Uh, we would welcome your support as becoming a member or donating to any of our programs to assist us with our efforts to keep the legacy of the Negro Leagues alive. If you're so inclined, you can follow me on Twitter I'm at NLBM Prez, P R E Z, and Instagram or with the same username. I'm on there. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm on there. And, <laughs> and, and we try to make sure that we keep uh, dialogue going on around Negro Leagues history and everything that's going on here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And please visit uh, tippingyourcap.com. Take that photograph, short video, and, and join us in our effort to recognize the 100th anniversary of the birth of the Negro Leagues. Thank you so Great, Bob. much. A, a pleasure always to, to talk to you. And, you know, Stephanie, I had to tell you, I think we should go into extra innings here. I think we could keep <laughs> going and, and yes. this is a lot we'll of fun. We'll do more. Uh, we'll bring you back to do more. We'll have more topics. <laughs> oh, yeah. This, this awesome. is just 101. There, there are plenty. Of, we can go. We can do a deep dive. But uh, I just want to thank New Jersey City University, you, Stephanie, Ira Thor, who, who reached out to me, and, and uh, Anna, and everybody else who really – made yeah. that happen. I, I had, a, had a great time today. I'm not a big social media person, so I'm not really on anywhere. So uh, if anybody, <laughs> you, what you can do is you can give them my personal information and they can contact me at any point they want. And I, I've given tours to people of Hinchliffe Stadium, did so recently, uh, and I'll continue to do it again. So uh, let's keep going. And, and, and one last thing I want to leave everyone with, let's bring home plate to its original League League location at Hinchliffe Stadium. It's very important. Maybe we can start a petition or something like that. Because that sounds great. You don't want people going there to say, well, where do they play? Well, we don't know. Right. We, we have to know. We have to teach these, these, these lessons to everybody. Fabulous. She does. Well, we also want to thank Anna Carhart, our theater manager, Justin Tinker, our technical director, and Sabrina Sabalo, who is our box office manager and Zoom coordinator um, for making this happen. You're amazing. And um, our upcoming events, um, please visit njcu.edu slash arts to see a list of our upcoming events. On Tuesday, September 8th at, se at 7 p.m., um, NJCU Center for the Arts, the Jersey City Office of Cultural Affairs, Jersey City Arts Council, and Rising Tide Capital will come back with our bi-weekly Zoom call for artists and arts organizations. And then on Tuesday, September 22nd, 1230 p.m. to 2 p.m., we have an artist talk with 
Winifred McNeil and Dr. Midori Yoshimoto. Um, and we have some more things coming, so please join us. We hope you've had a great day today. Um, I've had so much fun and thank you all again. Bye everybody. <laughs>